and I'm going to share my screen. All right, Stephanie. Okay, do you want, yeah. So um, McCain Library, we have our own little vinyl collection. Um, we have about over 400 albums. They're located on the ground floor of the library. Um, the collection is, 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 it's really unique. I mean, if you wanna come check it out, you're probably gonna hear things you have never heard before. Um, there's lots of jazz and folk, um, some classical, and we have spoken word, be it like poetries or um, po poems or recorded plays. Um, everything from like balalaika choruses to gamelan ensembles. There's like Japanese puppet theater music. Um, some of the spoken word is, I think Margaret Atwood, we have some readings of her from, to Langston Hughes. Um, it's just some really neat stuff. And like I said, you've probably not heard it before. Um, you can either listen to our albums here in the library, or you can bring them up to the CERT desk and check them out to take them home with you if you have your own record player. So our collection is cataloged in Discogs, which Chris is going to talk about that a little bit later. We can take a look at what you're going to see when you click on it. It's a list of all of our, I think, 455 um, records. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's pretty much if you see something you like over in the little notes field, there's a number and you just make a note of that number, go to the shelf and the albums are arranged by that number. And like I said, you can either take them over to the record player in the library to check to listen to them or you can check them out and take them home with you. Um, we also wanted to mention our CD collection because if you are a music fan, we have over 3000 CDs. They're also on the ground floor of the library right next to the albums. Um, and to locate CDs within the collection, you just use WorldCat, McCain Library Catalog, and you can kind of do a little advanced functions to narrow it down so you're only looking at, at music CDs. Um, and again, it's it's a little more broad than the album collection, but lots, lots, of, lots of neat stuff in the CD collection as well. And then you can listen to them in the library or check them out to take them home with you. Oh, you know what I didn't think of? We also, if you want to listen to the CD and take it with you, we do have one or two boom boxes. Two. We have two. two boom boxes that have CD players. Mm -hmm. So you could also do that. Um, but if you don't have anything at home to listen to things with, we have our listening station. That's a picture of it. It's on the ground floor right next to the CDs and albums. Um, you can also, there's a function for um, cassette. I know cassette tapes are kind of having a revival. So if you have cassette tapes, but you don't have a cassette player, you can bring them in to listen to in, the, in our listening station. Um, and you can check out headphones from the library service desk and they just plug right in. There's also um, some instructions right next to it that aren't in the picture, but they are there now. So if you don't know how to operate a record player or a CD player, there's um, some easy, clear instructions for you to do that. Oh, can I add, I once, um, a, a library I worked at previously, there was a student who came in and another librarian uh, was going to let him use a record an LP that had a recording of something that he needed to listen to. And he looked at it and he said, well, what do I do with this? And she said, it's a record. And he said, I don't know what that is. And I don't know how to play it. And she went and showed him and he was just like blown away, but it made us feel very old. And this was, this was a few years ago. So don't be, uh, yeah, don't be intimidated if you've not played one before. Yeah, and we also have a music um, research guide that kind of um, talks a little bit more about our collection as well as shows some highlights from the collection. There's also some really neat links to like the history of vinyl, some early sound recording, some vintage equipment, things like that. So um, that's on the library homepage too. You can check that out. And do you wanna put, do you wanna go ahead and put this link in the chat, Stephanie? Sure. Okay. And some of the things that we're going to talk about, um, like record stores and things like that, are also here, which and some books and uh, other things that are located also on the ground floor there also. Okay. Did you want to say anything else, Stephanie, about the collection? Um, no, that's if you if you have any questions about it, or you know you forgot where it is, or you are scared to work the record player, just ask at the service desk up on the first floor, the main floor, and we can we can help you out. And I think. Um, 
we don't have a collection development policy for records in the way that we do for books. But I think if there is interest from faculty, staff, and students, I think this is definitely something we would add to. I just think we have to see, is there interest? Because we've certainly pared down the collection from uh, some that we had before that were not really things that people had any interest in. So if you or others do have an interest, definitely that's something to tell us about, and that'll kind of dictate growth. So I wanted to talk next. Oh, are any questions about our collection or the listening station or anything before we transition? Nope, okay. So um, as far as record collecting goes, I think it's really interesting. There's been this resurgence in vinyl and you can see this is a, from a site called Statista. And you can see that in 1995, record sales were pretty close to nothing. And now they're at 27 and a half million. That is incredible. I can't think of another physical form that's seen this kind of growth. And you can see here, it's really around, you know, like 2012 or 2013, you start to see this uptick. And it's really only in the last couple of years that you've seen this humongous growth. So there was a time, and I will really date myself by saying, when you're talking about the 90s here, records were so undesirable outside of a very small group of collectors that you could buy records for just about nothing. I had people giving me literally trunk loads of records, really good stuff, not garbage, that basically they had either convert, well, at that point in the mid nineties, most of them had converted over to CDs and they didn't want it anymore. And I did. Um, so there was, I would say as much as the sales of new LPs were very much down, there was, there was still a very much a hardcore collector um, group that did, but also, if you were someone into vinyl, this was like the golden age. This was this was a period where you could get things really inexpensively and a lot of really great stuff. So in some ways, sometimes I wish it was uh, 95 again as far as demand for vinyl because that was, that was a really good time. It's not like that anymore. Uh, with increased demand um, has brought about both used vinyl has certainly become much more expensive. New vinyl is much more expensive. If you all have bought a new record lately, I mean, paying 20 to $30 is not uncommon. Most new records, you're not really going to find one for under $20 for the most part. So that's really driven up prices. It's made it much harder to uh, find used vinyl very inexpensively. Although we'll talk about this. There's definitely ways to get um, used vinyl inexpensively if you're willing to dig through some things. Um, but I think it's interesting, even with this, these sales being up, record sales right now account for 4% of total sales uh, industry revenue for music. 62% of that is streaming services. And then I think at this point, it's down to like 3% are CDs. So when we talk about this final resurgence, I think it is important that we understand that you're not going to make a fortune off of your records unless you have very rare ones. Uh, so you need to be careful when buying new ones um, if you're doing so for investment purposes. Um, and then also you just need to remember as someone who has, like I said, thousands of these, when you move, <laughs> make sure you tell your movers in advance because I moved mine a few times and then I got to the point where I was like I'm killing myself I'm not doing this anymore and then the movers had to do it and they I don't think those movers would come back um, but what I say I think as, as far as vinyl goes and you all tell me if you feel differently but I think a, a big reason for this resurgence is they're tactile it's something you can touch and then the warmth of the sound, records certainly have a certain a warmth that comes off of them. Um, also the art, the record sleeves, certainly, you know, having a larger piece of art in and of itself is, is amazing. Um, and then also, I think a lot of people are very interested in engaging with the music so that it's not peripheral background because you have to flip the record and the needles playing on it. So it makes you engage in, with the music in a way that maybe um, you don't with streaming music. And then I think part of this, especially for record collectors, is the thrill of the hunt. When you find something and you're like, oh, wow, or you get something in the mail and it's like, oh, I've been wanting this, that's really cool too. So I think there's a number of, 
of different reasons there. Um, so I want to talk about sourcing thrift stores, you know, uh, 20 years ago, thrift stores, amazing. You could go in there and find some great stuff. I would say even up to five or 10 years ago, sometimes I could find decent stuff in thrift stores. Thrift stores now by and large are a complete waste of time, uh, unless you're into Lawrence Welk. And if you don't know who Lawrence Welk is, that's great. Because Lawrence Welk <laughs> is basically pretty, hopefully no one here is a Lawrence Welk fan, but it's basically pretty boring um like uh instrumental music it's it's not very good um and classical music so if you're into lawrence well classical music or um very under the radar gospel groups thrift stores are amazing but most people that's not what they collect so that makes them unreliable um condition issues a lot of times people donate things to thrift stores because they think that someone else wants it but if the sleeve is really badly damaged or the vinyl is really scratched it's not really it's not worth anything and you don't want to mess up your stylus your needle by playing that and also you don't want to listen to a record that has all kinds of scratches and pops and things like that so that's another issue is condition so thrift stores are great if you know if you're just going in and looking just I wouldn't count on finding anything it's been a few years since I found anything in a thrift store and I like thrift stores in general so I go to them quite often I think Stephanie well Stephanie and I have actually bumped into each other at thrift stores so I know Stephanie likes thrift stores too and that's I don't go there to get records although I always look at them but I don't yeah. think of them as way to source now what they are good for though is like the mid 90s when everyone was getting rid of their records everyone now is getting rid of their cds so who knows a cd resurgence may be around the corner too i do find that thrift stores are a great place to find cds so if you're also into cds great place and then also i have done some kind of like personal art projects with vinyl sleeves and vinyl you can make like coasters out of them wall art i've seen people actually laminate their floors with them that's that's a lot of work but if you wanted to so if you're making like if you want to do something that's kind of an art project with vinyl thrift stores are a amazing place to score them and that way you know the cover may look cool and the music's horrible but who matters because you're using it for artistic purposes and you don't really care what the music sounds like Record stores, which is um, mainly where Stephanie and I would go, we uh, like to support local record stores. And um, I know for me, uh, I love digging in record stores. I love just looking around. Um, Wax and Facts is, and I kind of put these in the order that that, that are my favorites, to be honest with you. Um, Wax and Facts is uh, probably the oldest um, record store in Atlanta that's uh, been in existence for this long it was established in 1976 interestingly the owner his name is danny beard he founded a label called db records which had bands like pylon um the b52s had their first single on that record label so it's kind of cool when you go in there like the guy who effectively found the b52s and released all this amazing music that's the that's the guy behind the counter um they've got a really extensive use stock of rock alternative so alternative by that i mean punk hardcore goth ska all that kind of stuff um r&b hip-hop soundtracks the i would say about four-fifths of their stock is used and then probably about a fifth of it's new their prices are really fair uh, they also have a bargain bin, like some dollar records that are below that sometimes you can find decent things in. But I would say Wax and Facts is my favorite just because I think it's most fairly priced. It has a really um, large selection and there's a lot of interesting stuff. It's my favorite record store. I mean, basically I've been, it's kind of funny because I sometimes I go in there and I'm like, I'll think to myself, I've literally been going in here for over 30 years. And so I still remember sometimes the first time I went in Wax and Facts, I was like 16 years old my first time I'd gone to Little Five Points in Atlanta and I was just thought it was like the coolest place in the world and I still get that feeling sometimes so part of this might be uh you know impacted by the fact that 16 year old Chris loved Wax and Facts too um Ella Guru is a record store in Decatur and actually this weekend they are having a big uh, sale on their dollar and three dollar records so if you want to look for things that are inexpensive uh, but also really good stuff. Ella Guru this weekend and beyond is a great place. 
the thing I love about LA Guru is there's no junk. There's no Lawrence Welk. There's no, there's no garbage. Everything is, is really, it's, it's basically handpicked by the owner. The prices are fair. They're not amazing, but they're fair. Uh, basically, he focuses most on rock, alternative, and R&B. Those are his big sections. Um, like I said, there's a huge $3 section filled with really good records. Like the $3 section is not junk. And then he also has a dollar section, which has good stuff in it too. And like I said, I believe this weekend they're having like a tent sale or something, and he's going to have thousands of these $1 and $3 records out there. And it, it's in uh, Decatur. Wuxtree is, Wuxtree's in Decatur too, isn't it, Stephanie? Yep. Yeah, Wuxtree's in Decatur. There's also one in Athens. Um, again, extensive rock alternative R&B. They also have a lot of classical music there. They have a dollar section outside that sometimes has some good stuff in it. Their prices are really good. Um, it's a fun record store. And Wuxtree's been around, hasn't it been around since the 70s too? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and there's also one in Athens. My preference personally is the one in Decatur. I find it to be a little more fairly priced than the one in Athens. But I know, Stephanie, do you do you have a preference for the Athens one? Um, I just kind of like it. The Athens one is like, history. I don't know if you know R.E.M., if you're an R.E.M. Mm -hmm. fan, but that's how Michael Stipe, you know, that's how he was hanging out in the record store. Didn't Peter so, Buck have a job there? Didn't Peter, he Buck, Peter Buck was working at Walk Street, Michael Stipe was a customer, and there you go. Music history made it. Yeah, history, it's so. it's cool with some of these local record stores too. Like if you know, it's like oh my, like REM worked here basically, or oh this is the guy that released the B fifty twos and um, the swimming pool cues and these other Atlanta bands. It's just like oh that's really cool. Um, Criminal Records is large. It carries every genre of music. They have lots of new vinyl. They have a really good $3 section that I really like a lot. Uh, I've gotten really good stuff out of there. But I would warn you, Criminal Records used vinyl prices are, I'll just be honest with you, they're insane. Um, never pay $30 for a Hall & Oates record. That's, that's a crime. So <laughs> no pun intended. So if, I, if you went into Criminal Records, just know with the used vinyl, I would probably steer clear of it. The new vinyl is fairly priced for what you have to pay for new vinyl. And there's a really large $3 section that's pretty good. But Criminal Records is probably the only one where I would say, mm, they use vinyl, it's, it's out of my price range. And then Waterloo Sunlet, uh, uh, Sunset Records, named after uh, Kinks, is um, a record shop out in, it's in Atlanta, but it's kind of like Atlanta Marietta. It's by the stadium, the Brave, Brave Stadium. This place has an amazing stock, rock, alternative, R&B. Uh, they have an amazing dollar section that has really good stuff in it. Um, and everything is really well laid out. I really like the way everything is categorized. So Waterloo Sunset is an amazing record store. So all of these are great. Kind of, I probably honestly would probably Waterloo. I would probably make third. And then Wax Street would probably be fourth and Criminal Records fifth. But basically, these are the ones um, that I would suggest. And I think, Stephanie, was there anything else that you were thinking of other than these five? Um, I don't know. There may, if I did, it's on that that loop guide that I posted the link to. So if there are any others that I, that I listed, they're there. So. Okay. Um, and then Discogs. Yeah, we talked about that before, which is what we've used to basically catalog our records. Uh, Discogs is also a great place to mail order things because it's mostly, well, it is, it's all private sellers. It's um, basically just people that own record shops or just are collectors selling vinyl. There's a lot of bargains on there. Literally everything that's ever been released is on sale on that, on that site. And then also I love getting things in the mail. So it is so cool to go home and there's a little package on the front steps. So Discogs is really cool for that too. So Discogs is really great. There are literally thousands of what are called distros or record labels that do mail order. So I can't list all of those, but certainly if there's a genre of music you're interested in, if you put in that like say punk distro or punk uh, record label or something like that or you just know an artist that's on a record label that's a great way to look too but that's always cool because then you can support the artist or the record label directly um a lot of people do use amazon i personally do not use amazon to buy lps from just because i would prefer 
to uh, buy from um, privately owned record stores or other collectors. But Amazon is a great place for deals. There's lots of great deals there. Some people also like Walmart. Um, Walmart does have some vinyl and there are some good deals there. Amazon is mostly new vinyl there. I would never buy used vinyl on Amazon. When I do see it there, it's very expensive, much more expensive than Discogs or going to a record store. Uh, so it's mostly new vinyl. And again, I think if you are going to do Amazon, uh, certainly I, everybody orders from Amazon. I guess just think about price and then also just think about, you know, corporate versus independent. And then pricing and condition. So like I said, unfortunately, if you were buying records 20 years ago, you would have been paying a lot less for them because people are getting rid of their records. At this point though, the vinyl resurgence means that prices are higher. So things like, I would probably tell you that Fleetwood Mac's Rumors, which is an amazing album, I have probably in the past seen, I am not exaggerating, 100 copies of that record in great shape. Now, when I go to look at records, I don't see, when I do see Fleetwood Mac's Rumors, it's like 20 or 30 bucks. At one time, like literally you could get it for a quarter because that record sold millions. There were so many of them. So what I wanted to say here is Fleetwood Mac, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, basically bands that sold, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of copies of their records, you don't ever want to pay more than 10 to $20 for those because there's so many of them. Just because the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, or Fleetwood Mac are popular does not mean that these records are worth a lot of money. Now that said, a copy of a Led Zeppelin album released in Turkey with a different sleeve, okay, you're not getting that for 10 or $20. But if we're just talking about your standard issue Led Zeppelin album, like I don't know, the last one they released, like Coda, or something like that, don't ever pay more than 10 or $20. Just because a band's popular does not mean that it's worth a lot of money. So you want to be careful with that. And then tips as far as when you're not sure about pricing, I would check Discogs for the average price so you know that you're not paying too much. Paying too little is great, but you don't want to pay too much. Uh, the dollar and $3 bins that I mentioned before, the different record stores, are a great place to both if you're starting, but also I still look through them because I still find things that are that are good in there. You never know. Something that you find um, that's of interest may not be uh, to others. Like personally, I am a huge fan of um, British punk, post-punk, um, goth, those kind of, that kind of music. A lot of times people aren't aware of who those bands are. And I find this stuff in the dollar and three dollar bins. And even though it may be worth a pretty decent amount of money, People don't know who these bands are because they're kind of obscure from, let's say, the early 1980s from Britain or Germany or someplace like that. So you can definitely find really interesting stuff. And I'd also say if it's a dollar and it looks interesting, you take a chance. And if you don't like it, then, you know, you're only out a buck. Um, I would be very wary of buying new vinyl unless it's something you really want because new vinyl is so expensive. Like, for instance, like, a Fleetwood Mac, um, most of their albums have been reissued on vinyl. You can still find them cheaper buying them used as opposed to buying them new. So if you're buying something new, just make sure it's something you really want because you're going to have to pay more for it. Also, with new vinyl, oftentimes now they're mastering it from CDs as opposed to the original um, tapes that would have been used. So when you're buying it, just understand you may be getting a recording that basically is going to sound like a CD on a record. Not to say it's going to sound bad. It's just if you're looking for analog sound through an LP, it may not contain that. So I'm just very wary of, of new pressings myself because of price and because of the way they're pressed. That's not to say I don't buy. I certainly buy new records. It's just, you know. And then just remember too, the less common will be more expensive. So the less common it is, the less it was... Um, produced, it, it will be more expensive, even if it's a very unknown artist. So if it's something you really want, and it's obscure, you, you do need to expect to pay more. And then condition, you always want to look at the record before you buy it. Always look at the record before you buy it. Scratches and pops 
and cracking scratches do not are do equal pops and um, crackling noises which is not something you want i think it's funny oftentimes people think oh records all the crackles and pops and it's like my records don't crack and pop because i don't buy scratched records if you like that certainly go ahead but when i look at a record if it's really scratched up i don't i don't buy it because i don't want to listen to a bunch of crackles and pops from scratches so do not expect that from vinyl that means the vinyl's worn or you need to replace your needle um, but then sometimes the record sleeves can be, you know, kind of damaged, but the vinyl inside is fine. So just because the record sleeve is damaged doesn't mean you can't look at the vinyl. The vinyl may be fine. And then this is a link and there's lots of different ones like this. Records can be cleaned. And if so, if it's dirty, but it doesn't have scratches, definitely I find records like that all the time. I bring them home, I clean them off. Basically, we're talking about dish soap and a sponge. You can be that simple with it and then clean them off and they sound great. But if it's got a bunch of scratches, there's not really much you can do about that. And then record players, um, Amazon is a great place to go. I would though steer clear of you don't want a really cheap model. If the record player honestly is less than $100, if that's what you can afford to start with, perfectly fine. But just understand that cheaper record players, especially there's a brand called Crosley that usually is, is very inexpensive. The needles on there, those have a lot more weight and they will wear deeper grooves into your vinyl. Basically, they kind of etch it out and they'll increase the possibility of pops and crackling and all that kind of stuff. So it's better to go for a more a slightly more expensive model. And this is one like that I would suggest um, just, you know, if you want something expensive, that's good. It's an Audio Technica model. On here, it goes for about $119. It's not going to put a lot of wear on your records. It uh, does everything you want. It has basic functions. So like something like this would be a good model. And you'll see, and I was telling Stephanie the other day, I have these run-ins sometimes, because again, I, I do love thrift stores. I've had people where I'm looking at, I always look at the stereo equipment, and people will say, oh, I've got this record player, but it doesn't make any sound. And they'll say, well, do you have it hooked up to a receiver and speakers? And they're like, well, no, why would I do that? And it's like, well, it sounds like you have a freestanding record player. Without a receiver and speakers, it doesn't have a way to make sound. So then I'll be like, oh, but if you buy this receiver and the speaker, you're fine. So when you're buying these, just make sure this one that I pointed out is a standalone. You would have to have a receiver and speakers. Some are all in ones, like the one we have downstairs is a includes a speaker and basically an in, inbuilt receiver. So just make sure you understand the difference there. I like components because you can just switch them out if one of them goes bad, but you certainly don't have to. You can have an all in one. Um, thrift stores are a great place to find record players. I don't find them as often as I used to, but thrift stores definitely have record players sometimes. A lot of people overlook, but relatives, your grandparents or your parents or your aunt and uncle, I'll bet you they have a record player in a closet that they've been hanging on to. And a lot of times this equipment that was purchased in the 60s, the 70s and the 80s is really good high-end stuff because especially in the 70s, People didn't in the US didn't really buy cheap uh, stereo equipment. Most equipment was made in the US and Japan. It was not junk. So if they've got that, you probably want to check the needle. But there's some great stuff here. Relatives, neighbors. I have found so many record players through um, thrift stores, estate sales. I've had people give them to me like relatives. That's a great place. Yard sales too. Yard sales. I see record players at yard sales all the time. And if you see a record player from the 1970s, that thing, you could probably drive a truck over it and it would be perfectly fine. So a lot of these older record players are really well constructed and high quality. So older, when it comes to the stereo equipment, a lot of times actually means better quality. And then I just put a link here and, and I'll send this out to everyone that's um, attending. But care is you want to make sure that your needle like if you go out and you, let's say you buy a record player from a thrift store, you want to check the needle. And this place is called turntable needles. Basically, if you go in, you can match up the needle, but you can also call them. And you could basically say, okay, I bought this brand of record player. Can, and they will be able to tell you what kind of needle you want. And needles are not expensive. You can usually get a new needle for like $10. 
So changing out the needle will, will lengthen the life of your vinyl. It'll sound a lot better. You want to do that regularly, but they're not expensive. There's literally a million different models of record players. So if it was me, I wouldn't even bother going through this. I would just call them or email them. And I'd say, hey, here's what I have. What would you suggest? Because that's literally what they do is sell record needles. So you will not be a person with an odd question. They will be used to answering these kinds of questions. And that was everything that we had. Are there any questions or just kind of general observations or things you might want to share? Can you check chat? Yeah, um, Joy just said she loved this. So thank you very much, Joy. We were glad right. you were here. Um, Mar Marty had said earlier, she's. it's cool to know that we have a collection here, so. And can I ask Joy, do you, are you currently, do you collect records? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. we can. Okay, um, yes, my parents bought me a record player in 2017 because I was starting to get into like vintage things. Mm -hmm. So right now I only have two records. I have a Sia album and an mm -hmm. Adele album, but I am trying to um, expand my collection. I am telling you for getting started, um, the Ella Guru, which is indicator, the, the $3 bin is amazing. There's really good stuff in there. And then a criminal records, that $3 bin, again, you'll find really good stuff in there. There's, there's junk, but there's good stuff. So those are great places to go. And plus when you buy things that like, um, like El Guru or criminal, you don't have to worry about them being all scratched up and that they wouldn't, they're not going to sell things like that because they don't want you to return them. So those are great places to get started. Um, but then also they have lots of new vinyl and all kinds of different genres and stuff too. I also, I would suggest too, that you, for me, um, I still buy vinyl because basically it's something I've, you know, started buying when I was a teenager, but uh, at times, like I can't help myself and I just buy more and more records, but again, uh, storage and things like that become an issue. So I think that you, you definitely need more than two, but I would suggest don't accumulate 5,000 because it is very hard to move 5,000 LPs unless you know you're going to be in the same place for a very long time. So I think you, you, you know, you want to like selectively grow that collection and CDs could be a good alternative too, because they do not weigh as much, but I have as many CDs, which if you accumulate that many of them also are not easy to move. Okay. Well, thank you for attending. Um, and I will send out this um, presentation and recording with all the links and everything. So hopefully if there's anything that you wanted to follow up on, you can do that. Or if there's any um, outstanding questions, you can let us know. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.